of the sarcoma. He even this time gave her thesis as a footnote, but did not explain to the NRC panel that her thesis completely contradicted what he was telling him, and similarly to his funders. Then, continuing the saga, or by the way, Douglas promotes fluoridation, he's also a consultant for COVID. Um, in January 2005, uh, acting on a tip off, my son Michael went to the rare books section of one of the Harvard libraries and found her PhD thesis and found this chapter, which we then sent to the NRC panel so that they actually had it. The Environmental Working Group then called for an investigation of Douglas and his scientific integrity because he concealed this from everybody. The NIH gave the investigation to Harvard. Harvard appointed, appointed a Blue Ribbon panel from the dental and medical schools, and after a year, they exonerated Douglas of deliberately, those who were deliberately concealing Bass's findings, which could be interpreted as a bumbling old twit who didn't know what he was doing, and he didn't just think it was important to tell people that Florida might actually be killing a few young men. Not many, not many, just one or two deaths. All of it to say one sixth of the two surfaces of the death. Basson, I was in college with John Cleese, who did the other little crazy. <laughs> Basson published research uh, in the main issue of the journal. And then something extraordinary happened. I don't think this happened very often. Her own advisor, her own professor, wrote a letter into the same journal and said, Don't take any notice of this study. My study will show <coughs> that this thesis does not hold. Now he promised this study in the May of 2000, in the summer of 2006. We just passed the summer of 2010. We are still waiting for this reputation. But meanwhile, the promoters of coronation are using this unpublished, unpeer-reviewed study to diffuse any concern about Bassett's work. Incredible. The key question is why did the NIH, the National Institute of Health, give this very sensitive study of a relationship? I mean, if there was a relationship between osteosarcoma and water fluoridation, it would kill the practice overnight, it would be over, finished. And they give it to a dental school to do. And they give it to a professor who's already published a paper which has said just that. If we find this relationship, it's the end of fluoridation. Which of course is so fantastic at fighting tooth decay in children. To a dentist school, a dental researcher, so known to be a promoter of fluoridation, also consultant for Congress. He received over a million dollars for this research and has published practically nothing on the subject. To get back to the subject of the science of it, if you look at the methodology that his graduate students and others have discussed on his study, you find that the biometric for exposure is fluoride bone levels at autopsy or operation. In other words, at age 20 we were happy. And what we know is that those bone levels at 20 don't give you any idea of what the exposure was in that critical period of six, seven, and eight years. So that's a a BS study if you're trying to be a thesis. Secondly, <coughs> what the controls were for his study? Other bone cancers. Now, if it turns out that fluoride causes any of those other bone cancers, in addition to osteosarcoma, it would just rule out the whole study right there and then. So what a ridiculous thing to do. But he gets away with it. Uh, and was he paid, my question is, was he paid to keep the lid on this threat to water production? That's what the money was. Blood money. Okay. Promoters confused the safety issue by claiming that if all the studies were harmly shown, the doses used were high. That's all the standard approach. The doses were high. But again, you know, completely confusing dose with concentration, concentration with dose. High is a vague term. You need a margin of safety analysis. When you expose your whole population to a therapeutically active substance, ideally we would want a margin of safety between the lowest toxic dose and the beneficial dose of at least 10. <coughs> you 
you would want the lowest toxic dose <coughs> to be at least 10 times higher than the beneficial dose. And you need that factor of 10 to account for the full range of sensitivity in any human population. It's called intra-species variability. Well, what have you got here? Um, and of course, you also have to take into account the full range of exposure. So you actually have two factors of 10. We would really want a factor of 100. Well, we have effects of one part per million, increased uptake of aluminum into rat brain. We have dendrochrosis impacting 30% of children. We have osteosarcoma in young men, whose studies are mixed. At 1.5 parts of women, we have a doubling of hip fractures in a Chinese study. At 1.9 parts of women, lowering of IQ. At 2.3 parts of women, lowering of thyroid activity. We don't even make the first factor of 10, let alone the second factor of 10. And the promotion of fluoridation is unscientific. Fluoridation is promoted by endorsements. It's not what the science says, it's who says it. The Canadian Dental Association, the Ontario Dental Association, the Canadian America, the, the Canadian Medical Association, this association, that association, say fluoridation is safe and effective. And if we say that enough times, it must be true. They don't make many references to scientific studies. Endorsements work with the general public, but in this case, they're a worthless scientific. <coughs> when the U.S. Public Health Service endorsed fluoridation in 1950, no trials had been completed. There was no significant health studies on the table. So you know it wasn't scientific in 1950, and they made sure it hasn't been very scientific since 1950. And the same with all these endorsements. When these, once this guy came out, the biggie, the top one, the one with all the funding, came out and said, it's great, it's great, the emperor says it's great, then all the little organizations that are going to suck on the public teeth for their research went, yes, we agree, we agree, we agree, we agree, we agree. <laughs> Weak and inadequate science. The key health studies have not been done in most fluoridating countries. There has been no investigation of a possible relationship between consumption of fluoridated water and lowered IQ in children. None in Canada. None! <coughs> Arthritic symptoms in adults. None in Canada. None in Australia. None in New Zealand. None in Ireland. None in England. None in Australia. None in America. And none in Israel. Hypothyroidism. None in all the above. Increased bone practice in children. Only that one solitary study in Mexico. On early onset of puberty, nobody has attempted in any of the fluoridated countries to reproduce Jennifer Luke's study, even though we've sent the whole PhD thesis to several health agencies. None. Alzheimer's disease in adults. None. Uh, nor have studies. Uh, investigated formally the many anecdotal reports that some individuals are highly sensitive to fluoride. They have never, ever gone to these people who say, when I take fluoridated water, I come out with pimples, I have headaches, I have pimples, all sorts of things, I have rashes, I have stomach ache, I have all these things, but when I stop drinking the fluoridated water, they all clear up, and when I have the fluoridated water, they come back again. It convinces most individuals that there's something going on here. And all they do is to say, this is anecdotal. And they've never, never attempted to put this on a scientific level. Never. This is single the most frustrating issue I've ever had in my life. For someone who's trained as a scientist, to see this utter violation of scientific principles, to see medical science, public health policy, absolutely torn up in front of your eyes, makes you very angry. But don't think for one moment that that anger distorts my view of the science. What you have here tonight is accurate science as anybody, any of you could get if you read the literature. That's all I'm saying. So I, I get a little upset with this. It does make me upset. I don't like liars, and I don't like liars working for our government in our money. If you want to lie, fine. Don't work for the industry. You pay a lot of money to lie. But if you're working for us, you tell the truth. There's no reason anybody that lies in government should be called on to resign. Period. In the civil service. We know the politicians lie. Said that already. Life with their teeth. But civil servants, if they're called lying, that's just bye-bye. And if a scientist 
If a scientist is caught lying, that scientist should give back their highest degree. There should be a contract. This contract is only valid to recognize your scientific credentials as long as you stick to the truth. The moment you massage the science, we want that bit of paper back. Because you're not worthy to have it. We can have, have a, a few studies have been used, have very few studies that use the severity of dental fluorosis as an obvious biomarker for these two. If you don't look, you don't find it. Dr. Peter Kuhn, the chief dental officer of Canada, told an audience in Dryden, Ontario, and I was there on April the 1st, 2007, to witness Peter Kuhn. He said, I walked down the high street this afternoon, he said, and I, I didn't see anybody growing horns. And you've been fluoridated for 40 years. This is the level of science of somebody who's the chief dental officer for Canada. I walked down your high street today and I didn't see anyone growing horns. And you have been fluoridated for 40 years. You can imagine these researchers in, in universities in Canada being sponsored by Health Canada. They said, well, this is what horns look like. I want you to see if they look like the horns of a cow or horns of an antler. And yes, you just go around, look at the whole population, see if you can find any horns. And uh, if you don't find any horns, we'll assume there's no bone damage, there's no brain damage, there's nothing else to work. Good God. Now, what's happening here is the proponents work backwards. From the notion that fluoridation must be safe. I mean, after all, the US Public Health told us in 1950 it was safe. And thus, any study that is published that finds any health problems must be junk science. And any opponent of fluoridation must be a wacky. You're working backwards. I mean, it's, it's, it's like a protective veil. This policy was anointed in oil by the US Public Health Service in 1915. And it's protected. Not only could fluoride not cause any harm in 1950, but there could never ever be a study that would find harm from 1950 to 2010. And if there's something different, then there must be something wrong with the study. In other words, fluoridation is promoted like a religion rather than a scientific analysis. Over 60 years, the fluoridation debate has been controlled largely by the dental profession. Now this profession has a single focus on teeth, with little or no expertise on other health issues. So the next time you're a public hearing, and a dentist says it's safe, put up your hand and say, you, you mean it's safe for teeth? Actually, no, it's not safe for teeth, it's never. You mean it's safe for the teeth? No, I mean it's safe. Oh, wait, you can't say that. You're a dentist. You don't have the authority or the professional expertise to tell us it's safe for the kidney, safe for the brain, safe for the liver, safe for the kidney. Tell me, shut up. You talk about teeth. We're for, oh, no. Well, you guys over here, you're all dentists, you talk about teeth. Okay, all the other people who are medically qualified, cultural colleges, you can talk about the other teeth. You can <coughs> we come to you all you talk about teeth. But no, they haven't, they control the teeth. The American Dental Association does not behave scientific. Look at this. You have to really read this to, to believe. And see the original document to believe that they have said it. Individual dentists must be convinced that they must be familiar with scientific reports of laboratory and field investigations on fluoridation to be effective participants in the promotion program. And if one participation is over neglect or professional responsibility, what kind of definition of a professional is that? You're at university, many of you folks here. <coughs> so what would you do? You're going to get your profession. Well, you don't really have to, have to, to, to know your subject uh, to go out and promote something. It might kill people. It might give them serious damage. It might lower their IQ. But you don't need to be an expert on that to be effective for promoting it. And you don't do it. It's an overt event of professional responsibility. My God. Shame. Yes, absolute shame. Now, the Center for Disease Control, if people think the Center for Disease Control is prevention out of Atlanta, Georgia, oh, they must be very, very good. They are the method. 
agency protecting the health. So when the Centre for Disease Control is quoted in practically every newspaper in every country in the world as saying that fluoridation is one of the top ten public health achievements of the 20th century, people